Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. <laughs> this morning we got to celebrate the baptism of Marty and Carrie's little baby, Mary. Mary's baptized, happy day, all her sins are washed away. God looked down on her and smiled. She became his own dear child. Today, we get to rejoice. We got a new sister in Christ. Mary Lyonet has been buried and raised with Jesus. She received the precious benefit of the precious blood of Jesus. She's been claimed as a child of God. She's been marked as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. And she has no idea that any of this has happened. And that's why a lot of people struggle with the idea of infant baptism. How can a baby have faith, receive faith, when the baptism, when the, when the baby doesn't even know what's happening? Well, that's a good question, and there's a even better answer. How can a baby receive faith when the baby doesn't know what's happening? Because faith is not a result of the work of man, it's the gift of God. Mary received the gift of faith because God the Holy Spirit worked through the means by which God promised the Holy Spirit would work through word and sacrament. Uh, the Apostle Peter declared this in his sermon on Pentecost. He said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises for you and for your children and for those who are far off. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. The forgiveness of sins, the gift of the Holy Spirit is for you and for your children. For everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Just as the Lord called Mary to himself this morning. Of course, Peter would later write in his epistle... Baptism now saves. Peter, of course, is not saying salvation is by Jesus plus baptism. He's not saying it's in, in addition to Jesus' work, but rather he's saying this is a means by which the saving work of Jesus is received. In baptism, God the Holy Spirit delivers what Jesus won on the cross. So the Holy Spirit delivers faith in Christ and the forgiveness of sins won by Christ. In baptism, we're united with Jesus in his death and in his resurrection, just as St. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6. That's what happened to Mary this morning. Mary was baptized into Christ. <laughs> and that's something to rejoice about. But the work for her mom and dad actually the work for the rest of us? Well, that's just gotten started, hasn't it? At the end of the baptismal rite, I say something like this. We receive you in Jesus' name as our sister in Christ, that together we might hear his word, receive his gifts, and proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And the congregation says, Amen. We welcome you in the name of the Lord. And now what we're saying is it's our responsibility too to make sure that this child is actually raised in the faith. They, they learn what it is that they've been baptized into. It's the responsibility of, of her parents, but getting a whole lot of help from the rest of us to teach Mary what God has done for her. She needs to learn what it means to bear the name of Christ, how those who are part of the family of God live, and she needs to continue to be fed with the holy food of God. Today's epistle reading is a, a fantastic reminder for us of what it means to be a Christian, to bear the name of Christ, to be baptized into Christ, to be part of the people of God. Now, we've talked about Mary's needs. You know, here's this little baby, and she's going to have to learn what it all means. But uh, Peter begins with actually saying, you know what, you can learn something from that little baby. He says, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. 
you know, a little baby, all they do initially is what? Eat and sleep and then need a diaper change because they have eaten, right? That's all they do. But that baby craves milk from mom. That baby knows that, that he or she needs that, that nourishment and, and wants to eat. And you see that in a baby? And, and Peter says, that's how it should be for you with the things of God. You should, you should long to have the word of God, to hear it, to receive it, to learn it. You should long to receive the, the Lord's Supper because this is your spiritual food by which you are receiving strength and you are being sustained in the faith. Peter says, uh, like a baby crying out to be fed, we should long for the things of God because by these our faith is sustained and we, we even grow and mature in the faith. And there we taste and see that the Lord is good. We're reminded how much God loves us. We're reminded of the grace of God and the forgiveness of sins that we have in Jesus. We receive the, the powerful working of the Holy Spirit, and we, we remember that even though we failed, Christ has succeeded. He succeeded in our place. I love the image that Peter gives here of the church, where he writes, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying a stone in Zion, a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. This is a great image of the church. Christ is the cornerstone. He's the foundation upon which we build and upon which everything else stands. But the church is then made up of all of these little stones, all of these living stones, those given faith in Christ. And, you know, a stone all by itself is just a stone, right? But you get a whole bunch of them together, and now you have a spiritual house, and that's what the Lord does. He, he brings us together upon the foundation of Christ, and he, he makes us into something far greater than we would be individually. Peter makes the point here, Christianity is not an individualistic endeavor. But those whom the Lord calls to faith, those baptized into Christ, they're brought into what? Community. Together, we're the people of God. Together, we're a holy priesthood that offers up our lives as spiritual sacrifices, uh, and we love God and neighbor together. Built on the rock, the church doth stand. At the end of the, the reading for today, Peter again speaks of that whole communal idea of the church and being a follower of Christ. He says, but... You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Now, last week when, uh, when Mary was born, uh, Matthew sent out a, an email with some details including the, the height and weight and all of that. And so he, he said, she is 53.3 er, centimeters. And I thought, what kind of a weirdo uses centimeters, you know? <laughs> We're American. We don't do that kind of thing. And then he said, she is 53.5 centimeters and 4.4 kilograms. Now, I read it, and I read it as pounds, because I'm American, of course. And it, you know, 4.4 pounds, that's a little baby. 4.4 kilograms is not such a little baby. Uh, and I thought, well, that's a tiny baby. But then I, <laughs> I was corrected, and I recognized it's not pounds, but kilograms. I, I said to Matthew, what, what kind of a weirdo uses kilograms? We're, we're Americans. What are we doing here? We're not in Europe. Come on. Uh, but 
that same idea that, that those you know, presuppositions that we have as Americans kind of might creep into our thinking as we get to verse 9. It says, but you, and being Americans, we hear that as second person singular, but you, but me, individually me. That's how we tend to hear you. And because we've kind of lost in our language, you know, you and ye, we don't use that anymore, right? But really, this is a second person plural. So my Greek professor in college said, well, you're not allowed to just translate a second person plural as you. You have to translate that as y'all, because that's really what it is. So y'all are a chosen priesthood, not individually, collectively. Jesus joined us together as living stones built upon the foundation of Christ, and he says, y'all are a chosen priesthood. Y'all are a chosen, uh, a holy nation. Y'all are a people of his own possession. This is something that we, we have to teach the little children about, but it's something that we might need to be reminded of too, right? Our first identity is not determined by our family, our age, our race, our sex, anything else other than the fact that we have been chosen by the Lord. We belong to him. That's our first identity. That's the primary thing about us. Those baptized into Christ have been redeemed by Christ. We've been made part of the family of God. That's our first and primary and most important identity. Your nationality, your race, all of those things that the world wants to group you by and segregate people by, none of that is as important as the fact that in Christ you are a family. That's why the church can be of different nationalities and skin colors and languages and still be one. Because what unites us is so much greater than anything that would separate us. In Christ, we are a holy nation. We are a people. In fact, I like how Peter goes through this. He basically speaks of the collective in every imaginable way so as to say, you see, you know, that nation thing, that people thing, that clan thing, all of that, none of that matters as much as who you are in Christ. It says, y'all are a chosen race. Now that word race there, in Greek, it's, it's genus. You're a, you're a chosen kindred, offspring, family, tribe. Y'all are a, chose, a holy nation. The Greek word there is Ethnos. Well, you can hear the word ethnic in that, right? And we want to group people together by ethnicity. And Paul, or Peter says, no, 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 no. In Christ, that's, that's your ethnicity. That's your people. Y'all are a people for his own possession. And the Greek word there translated as people is leos, which is another way of just saying the collective. So you got all of these different ways that Peter is saying, you want to know who you are? Well, it's found in Christ. All of these other things are fine, but they don't really matter compared to this. Together, you are a holy nation through Christ. Together, you are a chosen race. Together, you are God's chosen people. And, and this is part of what little Mary is going to need to be taught over the years, that she belongs to the Lord, that she's our sister in Christ. That she belongs. She belongs here. She belongs to us, and we belong to her. The same is true for you. You've been chosen by the Lord. You've been made part of his people. In his love, he has bought you. He has brought you. He has made you his own. He's made you part of his people. And so while the world might look at you and try to put you in all of these different categories, first and foremost, you can know who you are. You are a baptized child of God, and you are part of his people through Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting.